Good afternoon and welcome to our monthly UCIPM webinar. Uh, I am Carrie Winville Rojas, and I'm the Associate Director for the Urban and Community Program within the University of California Statewide Integrated Pest Management Program. Thank you for joining us today. So today's speaker, um, well, today's talk will be about subterranean termites and integrated pest management for these termites. And it will be presented by Dr. Andrew Sutherland, uh, area IPM, uh, urban IPM advisor for the San Francisco Bay Area. Andrew was UCANR's first cooperative extension advisor tasked with addressing urban, including structural and industrial pests and serving uh, urban pest management professionals. His program helps develop new and evaluate existing IPM strategies and tactics for key urban pests. As an entomologist, his focus is on urban insect pests, including bed bugs, termites, and cockroaches. All right, Andrew, I'm going to stop sharing my, my screen and you can go ahead and begin your presentation. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, we're going to talk today about termites. We'll focus on subterranean termites, and it's only a 40-minute webinar, so uh, we're going to focus on ecology um, prevention, especially prevention that you might be able to do as a property owner, and then uh, management, which is usually carried out by uh, pest management professionals um, in the structural pest control industry but um, it may be helpful if you're a property owner to learn about some of the methods being used and perhaps ways that you can uh, participate in discussions uh, with your professionals about management of subterranean, subterranean termites. Um, <clears throat> if you'd like to learn more about my research program, uh, please visit my website. Uh, we have active projects ongoing with cockroaches, termites, yellow jackets, oh my, uh, we may be working with bed bugs, biting mites in the near future. And um, the goal of the program is to work primarily with professionals to improve pest control through research and education in order to protect our communities and the environment. And, you know, this is more of the same, but you know, really I work with professionals primarily. And so um, I'm constantly assessing the needs of their industry and really reviewing the different challenges that they face and, and the different uh, methods they're using in the field. And I'm working with them uh, as their industry evolves to reduce unnecessary pesticide applications, which in turn improve some of our environmental qualities like uh, surface water. And then I'm also working with them to uh, increase provision of integrated pest management services. And hopefully uh, through outreach like this today, increase demand within their client base for these same IPM services. And, you know, this is my chance to get on my IPM soapbox here. Um, but what is it? You know, what is a simple way to understand IPM? It's just a decision-making process that helps us manage pests while minimizing negative impacts. And so those can be negative impacts on uh, human health in the community or on the environment. Um, and it's, it's important to realize that pests are pests because they need to be managed. Um, significant pests like termites that damage structures and cause economic, uh, uh, you know, damages need to be managed. And so we want to do it in a way that minimizes negative impacts. And, you know, more of the same here, urban IPM is important because um, we do have a lot of impervious surface you know, concrete, um, pavement, and pesticide applications may stick around. Uh, this may be less relevant for subterranean termites where a lot of pesticide applications are underground. But uh, needless to say, in urban areas, we do have problems with uh, environmental contamination. And we do have um, a lot of people sharing a lot of space or, you know, little space 
So we need to be smart about the way we are managing pests. So let's start talking about this uh, interesting tidbit that I threw into the um, uh, topic of the webinar here. Termites are actually social cockroaches. So, um, you know, we've looked at the morphology of termites for decades and considered that they're very closely uh, related um, to uh, cockroaches, mantids, even grasshoppers as a larger group. Um, but recently, you know, within the past 15 years or so, it has become very clear through uh, molecular techniques that termites are indeed highly evolved social cockroaches. The molecular data even places termites nested within cockroaches. So we may have learned if you guys ever took an entomology class in, uh, in college or um, any kind of training on entomology, you may have learned termites as a separate insect order called Isoptera. Uh, the new data suggests that termites are actually embedded within the cockroach family or the cockroach order, Blatodia, and uh, should you know, perhaps be considered as just a, a family of, of cockroaches. So a uh, very interesting little tidbit there. And in fact, um, there are some cockroaches that feed in uh, similar ways as do termites. So we have uh, actually in the Eastern United States, a species of uh, cockroach called um, the wood roach, Cryptocircus, and it shares a lot of ecological similarities with uh, primitive termites like um, uh, dampwood, uh, Zoothermopsis species. You know, they both feed on uh, rotting wood. They both require uh, gut symbionts, you know, so these are microbes living in their, in their gut that help them to digest uh, this complex food, cellulose. And they have to share uh, these symbionts amongst each other via trophallaxis. So that means they're consuming exudates that, you know, they're either spitting up or excreting from their back end that contain these microbes that they need. So they, they share those beneficial microbes with each other. Uh, this cockroach, Cryptocircus, actually cares for its young. You know, most cockroaches, they leave an egg case, uh, ootheca somewhere, and then they go about their business. And the babies, the nymphs that hatch from those eggs, are left to fend for themselves. With Cryptocircus, there's actually some parental care, um, and you can find aggregations of uh, cockroaches and their nymphs if you tear apart logs in uh, the Appalachian Mountains. So what does make a termite a termite? Um, looking at the morphology of the termite as an insect, uh, we think about that old ordinal name, Isoptera, which means wings are the same, same wings. And that's because the forewing and the hind wing of a winged termite are pretty much the same size and pretty much have the same appearance. And this is in contrast to something like an ant, bee, or a wasp, which has four wings much larger than the hind wings and very reduced venation in the hind wing. So uh, if you have a winged termite, you will expect to see four uh, equally sized and equally appearing uh, wings. They have mandibular mouth parts. So that means they chew, you know, and uh, these mouth parts are modified in um, the soldier termites. So the soldier is uh, the defense uh, team of the termite colony. They cannot even feed on their own because their mandibles are so large. They're not able to uh, you know, partition food resources and feed themselves. So the worker termites, which make up the majority of most termite colonies, uh, are tasked with uh, keeping these soldiers alive and feeding them. In return, the soldiers defend the colony from ants uh, and, and other enemies and predators. The other interesting thing about termites is they have this uh, division of labor that is uh, characterized by morphologically distinct castes, okay? So, there's a queen who lays the eggs, 
And uh, this, you know, may be similar to ants, bees, and wasps, but the thing that is different for termites is the queen also has a consort, a king. So ants, bees, and wasps, the males don't live very long. Uh, the females mate with them and then they die. With termites, uh, these uh, kings and queens may pair up for their entire life. And the queen, uh, her only job is to lay eggs. The king, his only job is to inseminate the queen or perhaps some of the other reproductive females in the colony. And um, the eggs develop uh, through different pathways. Some of the juvenile termites will follow the worker pathway and their job is going to be to construct tunnels to access uh, resources, cellulose resources out there in the environment and uh, to feed the rest of the colony. And you know, throughout the world, Termites are quite diverse. We're gonna focus on wood feeding termites, but we also have termites uh, that feed on uh, organic detritus in the soil, live plants or fungi. And in fact, if you look at the termite diversity on earth, um, it's really only the uh, lower termites. Um, that uh, we, th we think about, you know, causing a lot of damage. Um, a lot of the higher termites are involved in eating things like uh, animal feces um, or living plant material. And, you know, all of these termites are serving, uh, are, are providing ecological service to us by breaking down organic matter uh, as it's decomposing. So again, the wood feeders are, are primarily these uh, lower termites. And um, in California, we have three categories to consider that may become pests that are attacking our um, homes or other wooden structures. Uh, the subterranean termites, which we'll focus on here, uh, these have their colonies based underground, you know, in the soil, usually. And from there, they will forage out and access different cellulose resources, perhaps your home. Drywood termites, uh, on the other hand, live entirely within wood. Uh, these are also significant pests here in California, and they do not have a connection to the soil. So they will colonize, uh, you know, part of a, a structure, for instance, and um, may live entirely within one wood member or several adjacent wood members for their entire life, kind of hidden within the wood eating away. And then damp wood termites, uh, also native species, very large, interesting termites. And uh, they need wood that is uh, soft, usually rotting and wet. Um, and uh, they may be found in contact with the soil or not, but the factor that's important there is uh, the wood must be uh, moist, moist enough for them to consume. In the image, uh, well, all three images on the bottom of this slide, you see our main three pest species in California generalized as subterranean dry wood and damp wood termite. And you see they have different sizes. Um, on the left, you see the workers. The subterranean is the smallest of these. Um, in the middle, you see the soldiers. Note those large mandibles for defending the colony. And then on the right, you see the winged or alate termites. So the wing termites are the ones which leave the colony in order to uh, find a mate and start their own colony. So uh, we talk about termites as pests. It's um, valuable to consider this question. What's a pest? It's any organism that occurs where it's not wanted or it's causing damage to crops, animals, humans, infrastructure, or ecosystems. Well, termites fall solidly into this category when they are threatening our homes or other infrastructure. And so they are managed as pests when found in that way. But if you think about all of the species of termites we have throughout the world, only a small fraction of them are considered economic pests. The others, as I was explaining, uh, play very important ecological roles, recycling nutrients, aerating soil, uh, you know, breaking down leaf litter, 
And, um, you know, here in the United States, uh, we only have about 15 uh, termite species that are managed as pests. So this is the star of our show today, Reticulotermes hesperus, commonly known as the Western subterranean termite. This is a native species found throughout the Western uh, coast of North America, from Southern British Columbia, all the way down into Baja, California. And um, very, very common. Um, it is, uh, a social insect, it can have hundreds of thousands of members in one colony. And the interesting thing is that this termite species uh, may have multiple reproductive members. So I mentioned that king and queen, um, this is a species that can also develop secondary reproductive members. So other females that developed uh, at one time as um, you know juveniles in the colony, but they have grown to reproductive capacity and they share in the egg laying responsibility with the primary queen. So that means you can have egg production in multiple places in a large colony. Now the colonies are large uh, and wide ranging because they must exploit widespread shifting resources. So in the lower left, I have an oak woodland. Um, this was photographed in one of our East Bay Regional Parks, but this is one of the native habitats. And if you think about that habitat, there are wood resources that come available, but they don't last forever. And it may be a fallen tree, it may be some dead roots, and a colony as it grows needs to be able to respond to these new resources coming available and old resources uh, being consumed or drying up or, you know, in some cases burning up, you know, with, with uh, our, our fire cycles. So um, they're constantly uh, foraging in these underground tunnels, uh, looking for things to eat. When they do find things, they recruit others and uh, start accessing these resources. So uh, they can adapt and respond to changing conditions pretty rapidly. The other thing to, to remember, uh, those of us who live here in California, we're living it every year, but there's a wet season and then there's a very hot dry season. In some areas we have clay soil that is you know, sticky mud in the wintertime and hard as a rock in the summer. So that means termite uh, foraging um, may have to move vertically in the soil profile to respond to those environmental conditions. The cartoon I'm showing you here with the house and the tree uh, shows an example of a hypothetical uh, colony foraging range. You know, so perhaps the colony started close to a tree with some dead roots, but as it grows, it expands and may start to forage adjacent to or even within. Um, structural members of a home that's nearby. In yellow, I have written that this is an apparent species complex. And I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean, but we think that Reticulotermes hesperus may comprise more than just one species. So what we're calling Western subterranean termite uh, may in the future be split into multiple species that have slightly different uh, ecologies. So we may see termites most conspicuously when they swarm. And so on the bottom here in the middle, there's an image of uh, alate or winged termites that issue forth from a subterranean colony, usually once a year. And uh, these are all virgin queens and kings. And their job is to fly usually a short distance or they may be aided by wind and to find a mate. And once they do find a mate, uh, they establish what's called a nuptial pair. That nuptial pair must then find a place to start their own colony. It's usually gonna be in soil, perhaps in wood that's buried in soil. So they will tunnel into that new resource, excavate a small chamber and start laying eggs. And as those eggs hatch, 
the workers that develop will help them to increase that tunnel system and ultimately to increase the size of the colony. So um, I mentioned that the colonies uh, grow moderately, um, but you may eventually have hundreds of thousands of individuals and um, usually within five to 10 years of that nuptial pair establishing the colony, you have enough uh, where new uh, queens and kings will be produced and there will be a swarm from that uh, burgeoning colony. So this is a, just an example of the different developmental pathways a termite could take uh, once it hatches from an egg. So the first instar uh, is, is called a larva, although entomologically this is a nymph. Um, termites undergo uh, incomplete metamorphosis, so there's no true larva, but this stage here uh, can differentiate um, into a worker pathway, which uh, could continue as a worker for the rest of its life, or could uh, you know, upgrade or change into a soldier through molting. Workers can also become secondary reproductive members. Uh, and then of course, a larva could instead differentiate towards a reproductive pathway from the beginning and uh, metamorphose into a nymph and eventually a winged alate. And that winged alate, of course, is going to leave the colony, find a mate, fall in love and start its own colony, shed its wings, and so when you do see uh, dark or melanized uh, termites that look like this, um, oftentimes they are uh, kings and queens that have flown, um, but now have settled down and started to um, raise their own family. So um, this is an image, and I'm sorry if the quality is bad here, but this is uh, what's called a brood chamber, or it's just adjacent to a brood chamber within a subterranean termite colony, you can see lots of tiny little uh, first instar uh, termite larvae, all right? And actually, um, this image doesn't show it, but right under this piece of bark, there was an aggregation of eggs that were laid by uh, some reproductive female in this colony. Many of these individuals that you see in this image have elongated abdomens. Some of them may have wing buds, so wings are starting to develop. So we see here a mix of uh, secondary reproductive members who are helping to uh, increase egg production. They are not the primary queen. You can tell because their bodies are light, translucent in color. They've never flown in the sunlight as the primary queen has. So how does this work in our schematic? You may, event, you may at one time have a colonization event from the primary reproductive. So here's your primary king and queen. Um, but over time, as this colony expands, you may have secondary reproductive members established in other parts of the colony's range. And all of these can lead to uh, brood chambers or development of uh, new workers and new soldiers. So in this way, a colony can start to grow uh, much more rapidly as its numbers increase. So what do we do about subterranean termites? Um, they're present in most of our, uh, on most of our properties. They're native. They were here way before us. I think it's important to focus first on prevention. And in fact, this is one of the uh, central tenets of IPM is to consider prevention before any management is necessary. So in our building codes, we do have uh, uh, elements that seek to prevent subterranean termite attack. One of them is a wood treatment of um, uh, wood that's used in construction, especially wood that will be close to or in contact with the ground. Um, and so in these cases, different uh, materials, different uh, insecticides or other toxic materials are actually impregnated into the wood uh, in order to prevent uh, termite attack. We also have um, uh, codes in place that allow us to uh, more easily inspect structures. 
So one of the things I wanted to point out is uh, stucco. And a lot of us in California have stucco um, uh, exterior uh, you know, sheathing. The problem is that stucco may extend below the soil or very close to the soil. In this image, the red line uh, indicates um, the soil grade and the stucco sheathing extends way below that. So termites, uh, in order to access a wooden structure, they uh, have to crawl um, over some elements or through some elements. And if they are exposed to the air, they will build what's called a shelter tube. I'll show you some of those in a second. It's really just a, a bunch of mud and saliva that's stuck together that allows them to travel without being exposed uh, to the sunlight or the drying air. And so in a uh, properly constructed home, there will be uh, four inches minimum between the soil and the stucco sheathing so that an inspector can see the foundation. And so this is most uh, uh, relevant for a raised foundation, which is common in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, but if the sheathing does not follow that code and in, in fact extends below the soil grade, you can see how subterranean termites could enter the structure uh, behind this stucco sheathing and you would never see them. Moisture management is important. Um, anytime you have uh, mulch or irrigation, especially if it's faulty or leaky irrigation near a home, uh, you are creating an environment that is inviting to subterranean termites. They are attracted to moisture. Uh, they need moisture to survive. Another way we can uh, try to stay ahead of a termite infestation is by monitoring. So monitoring means we are looking for signs of subterranean termites and especially signs of uh, termite infestations in our home. And so uh, this can be done by regular inspections, uh, preferably by a professional. They've been trained, they know where to look and what to look for, but you can do some of these inspections uh, on your own. The most conspicuous may be sighting a swarm. And so here's another image of a swarm uh, on your property. That tells you there is a mature reproducing termite colony under the ground there. And you won't be able to tell how far it extends or whether it's in your home, um, but it gives you a great clue. Now, of course, if you're seeing a swarm emerge from within your home, that's a great sign that you've actually got termites in your home already eating the wood. I mentioned shelter tubes. Uh, these are some shelter tubes that termites have built uh, from these floor joists down to the ground. They're called drop tubes. And they do this to access moisture. You know, so perhaps they colonize this wood member, but there's not enough moisture. So they can access soil moisture and bring it back up into the, uh, uh, the wood member here. But you may see these uh, shelter tubes also adhering to the side of a foundation or the side of a brick facade. Um, and um, you can break them open. You may see termites running around inside. So this is another thing that we're looking for uh, during termite inspection. Termites cause very distinctive damage to wood. In this image on the lower left, you see this kind of uh, striped or striated damage. And what you're seeing is that subterranean termites preferentially eat the softer or less dense uh, wood. And so um, when a tree uh, you know, produces wood, it produces its xylem cells, they are uh, different densities um, or the aggregation of those cells is a different density depending on how much water the tree has, how fast it's growing. So typically in the spring you have large cells and you have a much uh, less dense wood. As the water, uh, you know, decreases or as the heat increases, if growth rates start slowing down, those cells get packed closely, more closely together, and the wood is much more dense. So subterranean termites, if, if they're able, they only eat the spring wood or the less dense wood. So what you're seeing is just a, kind of like a, 
uh, a tree ring here that is um, you know, really highlighted by the feeding of the termites only on uh, one part of the wood. There are monitoring devices that uh, you can use, but um, even better, there are um, monitoring devices that professionals can install and check regularly. <clears throat> and so this is just one of those devices. It's really just a wooden stake that's uh, hammered into the ground and um, associated with a plastic uh, housing on top of the ground. So you can open that periodically and um, there's a piece of cardboard within the plastic housing. So the idea is that the termites will find the stake, travel up the stake and start eating the cardboard. Um, if you're in a very dry or hot environment, they probably will not be found in this cardboard up here, but you can pull the stake out and see if there's this distinctive damage or sometimes there will be termites present. So these are all ways that you can monitor not only for termite presence, but actual infestation. Now, um, we do have these conspicuous swarm events and especially here in the San Francisco Bay Area, we have uh, in mass swarming events. So that means all of the termite colonies in a region are gonna swarm at the exact same time. And it makes sense that maximizes their uh, chance of finding a mate from another colony and then um, establishing hybrid vigor uh, in their offspring, you know, so really uh, outcrossing their, their colony, maximizing that potential. And in the San Francisco Bay Area, we typically see these in mass events on the first sunny, warm day without wind after the first significant rain event in the fall. And um, so this did happen in October of last year, and there were a lot of media stories, and we did publish this blog article talking about what's happening, what are you seeing, what does it mean for uh, termites on your property. Now, the interesting thing is that Western subterranean termites in California have been observed to swarm at two different times in the year, spring and fall. And you can see this if you go on to the iNaturalist page for Reticula termis hesperus, there are two peaks. There's a peak in late March, early April, guess what, we're almost there. And then there's a peak uh, in um, November, December that uh, usually corresponds to that uh, first rain in mass event. Sometimes it's a larger peak because there may be more uh, observed at the same time. Um, and so if you think about it, these two uh, swarm phenotypes will never have the opportunity uh, to interbreed. So what we think is happening is either these are already different species that have been lumped into the same name, or uh, there's a speciation event that's underway. So these different populations are becoming different species and they may follow different evolutionary pathways moving forward. But it remains an unanswered question. So uh, what I'd like you guys to do, if you do see swarming termites in California in the springtime, we want your specimens. Um, so there's a blog article uh, that went out last year that explains how to do this. And um, we're offering, uh, a free poster uh, to you guys. It's called the Common Cockroaches of California. If you can submit a qualified uh, group of specimens, or if you are a professional, I'm offering a free continuing education class for you and your colleagues, if you're able to provide me with an appropriate um, uh, collection of these specimens. Uh, so these are just some videos that we took back in the fall during the swarm event, and you can see uh, termites coming out of different um, structural elements. On the left, this is actually asphalt that was, uh, you know, poured um, and applied to uh, a pavement area near a structure. There's no uh, exposed wood anywhere, anywhere nearby, so it's unclear where the colony uh, you know, really it is existing, but 
you see a lot of alate termites coming out of this little hole in the asphalt. Uh, this on the right is an infested stump, um, or at least the stump is being used um, as an exit uh, ramp for these uh, flying alate termites. So we were very lucky to, to get these images. This event, the swarm, uh, can start and finish within 10 minutes. It really is dependent on conditions and you have to be in the right place at the right time. Now, luckily, we have been anticipating events like this and we were able to work together with the KQED Deep Look film crew this past year. And they brought out some specialized equipment uh, to the UC Berkeley Richmond Field Station. And we actually recorded some excellent footage of swarming termites, uh, in addition to the different predators in the environment that take advantage of this bounty of food. We videotaped spiders, birds, ants, uh, preying on and attacking these uh, alate termites as they um, left uh, their colonies. So please check that out. It's an excellent video, excellent collaboration with KQED. Okay, so let's say you have found termites. Um, usually people think about insecticides for management of termites. Uh, there are sometimes uh, non-chemical approaches. Uh, for instance, with dry wood termites, if you can find the wood that they're infesting, you can actually remove it from the structure and replace it. Uh, or you may be able to use a heat treatment. Um, but in most cases, especially with subterranean termites, management uh, will involve some kind of insecticide treatment. And so uh, there are two main categories out there used by the industry. The first is uh, liquid barriers, and the second is uh, baits. So with the liquid barriers, the idea is to create um, a zone of insecticide treated soil that's around the structure. And so in my cartoon here, the pink, remember, is the hypothetical range of the termite colony. The yellow here would be the soil that is treated surrounding and sometimes under the structure. And the idea here is that, um, you know, some of these materials are repellent and they work by repelling foraging termites away, but the most effective ones are actually non-repellent and the termites don't know that the toxin is present. So what they do is they crawl through that zone, they pick up uh, the insecticide. Many times they actually transfer it to their uh, nest mates uh, through trophallaxis or through uh, grooming of each other. And um, a lot of termites can die uh, as, a as a result of this. Sometimes entire colonies can be eliminated, um, but you know a lot of the manufacturers of these products will shy away from claims that they eliminate colonies because what we see, especially with the larger colonies, is that they can protect structures with this approach, but the termite colony will still be present just outside of the treated area, and they may be able to um, uh, reinvade in the future because these residues don't last forever. They do last a long time, five to 10 years for uh, the really effective ones, but uh, they don't last forever. Now, um, another approach considered an alternative to liquids is to use baits. And baits are uh, devices that are installed in the ground, usually around the perimeter of a structure that's to be protected. And they contain a uh, matrix of cellulose mixed with a slow acting insecticide. Um, in the case of the baits that are registered in California, these insecticides are all chitin synthesis inhibitors. That means they interfere with the molting process um, of termites. Worker termites molt every 30 or 40 days and so during that process, if they have consumed one of these chitin synthesis inhibitors, they will not be able to synthesize their new exoskeleton. So they will die, they will dry out. Um, and as a result, other members of the colony that rely on the uh, workers 
to feed them like the soldiers and sometimes the reproductive members uh, will starve. So uh, here's a cartoon showing uh, how bait stations may be installed at regular intervals, usually 10 to 20 feet around the perimeter of a structure. And above ground, you might just see a disc or a circle that uh, shows you where the underground portions are there. And um, you know, if done correctly, the only way that these insecticides leave this station is within the body of a termite that has consumed them. Um, and they have demonstrated multiple times colony elimination using these bait station systems. Um, so the way it works, uh, the bait matrix is a food item, it's cellulose. Um, the toxicant is not repellent, so it's consumed and shared. Remember, termites are sharing their food via trophallaxis. So, uh, you know, they all will die, those that have consumed this uh, chitin synthesis inhibitor, when they molt. Um, soldiers and reproductive members are terminal uh, uh, stages. They do not molt, but they may starve because the, the workers are not there to feed them. And so lots of research over the years has shown that this approach does eliminate entire colonies. And so they are able to do this by uh, marking different termites. Um, and since termites share food, you can get some termites to feed on a dyed food item, and then you can see it present in other members of the colony. We also do it by DNA. So we can collect termites from one colony that might be feeding on a bait, and then we look to see if we can detect that colony again somewhere else, uh, which would suggest the bait's not working. But in, in most cases, once termites have been collected feeding on baits, they never get seen again um, at, that, uh, at that site. So bait stations can also be used as monitors. Uh, there are um, uh, bait station components uh, that are specifically designed for monitoring. So here's one here called a termite inspection cartridge. And um, it can be placed into a bait station. It does not contain an insecticide, uh, but it does contain cellulose. Or you could put a piece of wood into a bait station. And if these are checked on a regular basis, um, hopefully by a professional, you can identify a problem, you can identify a termite species, and you could move forward with management. So I know I'm going to run out of time here shortly, but I wanted to touch on some of the applied research that we've done in my program. We're really interested with these questions. Can we use baits to exclude termites from structures? Can we use baits to eliminate colonies? And how should pest management professionals utilize these baits if they want to maximize success in controlling termites for uh, property owners? So um, we've looked at baits uh, since 2014, and our methods usually is we're looking for homes that have termite pressure. So there's termites present within a meter of their foundation, but the homes themselves are not yet infested. And the reason is because bait stations take some time for termites to find and to eliminate colonies. And if your home is actively infested, you probably want uh, control as soon as possible to uh, prevent wood damage and moisture uh, intrusion in the structure. So uh, in this first example, we looked at five single family homes um, where those conditions were met. We installed a system according to the label. We collected uh, termites whenever we could so that we could characterize their DNA. We monitored for their presence using um, one of those monitoring devices uh, I explained. And then we also uh, served our baits according to label, um, measuring how long it took for them to become attacked by termites. So uh, our monitoring data showed us that um, termite activity in the San Francisco Bay does seem to be uh, temporarily concentrated in the period between February and June. So guess what, that's right now. Uh, and that's because the soil is relatively moist, but temperatures are starting to warm. We also saw a spike in activity 
right immediately prior to our fall swarms um, in late September. This is an example of uh, what we did with that monitoring data. Uh, we used an index to describe termite feeding. And so this is one house where we had uh, feeding on one of our stations um, in, um, this was uh, December, 2014. We collected those insects and uh, called them colony A. Um, a year later, uh, we did not find any activity on that side of the house. In the third year of the project, we started to see more activity over there. That was the south side of the house. Uh, but this time, the termites were identified as a different colony. And colonies do not share food. So we may have eliminated colony A, and now we have another colony, colony B, that's visiting the site. And in fact, a year later, uh, we were not able to find any of these termites at the site. So what we hypothesize has happened is we have eliminated successive colonies during this four-year uh, intervention at this uh, site in San Jose. Um, during that four-year project, we did not observe any structural infestations at our five sites. We collected multiple colonies at all of our sites, and um, every time we collected a colony from bait, we never saw them again. So we're doing something similar right now at 15 sites, and we've included the uh, Los Angeles area um, as well as the Bay Area. And we're also looking at all three bait systems that are registered for use in California. Um, and what we're seeing is the same trends. We're detecting multiple colonies, and once we detect colonies in baits, we're not seeing them again. That project is ongoing, so I don't have uh, data to share with you guys uh, just yet. Um, at some of our homes, we're seeing a lot of termite colonies. And um, I think this speaks to the possibility of young or incipient colonies. Um, you may have uh, lots of small colonies developing in areas where you have a lot of swarming, and um, those colonies may in turn start to compete with one another and some of them may decline or even disappear, but it's not unusual to find lots and lots of little termite colonies. Remember, this is a native insect. They've been here way before us. Another thing we're doing is trying to uh, measure how much time it takes for termites to find baits that are in the ground. And so we actually um, have considered season as a factor for this. If you install baits at the beginning of the wet season, uh, can you reduce the time it takes termites to find those baits? Since they're in the top eight inches of soil or so, uh, they may not visit if it's uh, hot and dry. Um, first, we do see the same kinds of seasonal activity patterns where uh, spring, you know, early spring going into late spring is a very hot time. Uh, for termites in, in, um, uh, throughout California. Uh, but what we saw is that indeed, if baits are installed at the beginning of the wet season, in our study, it was December 16th, uh, the time required for termites to find those baits can be significantly reduced. Uh, I'm gonna run out of time, but I just wanted to mention that we also have an invasive species that's found at a few locations in Southern California. And this is called the Formosan subterranean termite, Coptotermes formosanus. And this species can develop much larger colonies, up to uh, you know, two or even three million individuals per colony. So they're larger than our native species. They are also known to feed on the dead uh, central um, uh, stem of trees as well as get up into uh, structural members of a, of a home or other structure and um, even build partial nests called carton nests inside structures. So it's a major issue and we hope that uh, it stays down in Southern California. We also hope that we can uh, perhaps reduce or eradicate these populations over time. And there's some uh, alert information about this species if you are in LA, Riverside, or San Diego counties, 
you want to learn about this termite. What does it look like? Uh, it flies at night or at least at dusk, which is different from our native species. So if you are seeing termites attracted to, let's say, porch lights in the evening, um, in the in the springtime, late spring, you may be dealing with uh, Formosan subterranean termites. Uh, so in summary, termites are really interesting. They do provide a lot of cool services uh, for ecosystems, but they also may represent pests. So uh, termite management requires IPM, which focuses on prevention and monitoring, uh, which can be done during regular inspections. Baits can be considered as an alternative to uh, liquid insecticide applications. We have materials at UCIPM to learn more. And because I know there may be questions, let me go ahead and skip to my last page. And um, I'm available for questions, I think for five minutes here. Great, thank you, Andrew, for that excellent overview of subterranean termites and, and other termites.